So my advisor was uh, invited to give a talk, Olaf Schenk. Uh, he's at, at the Uzi in Lugano here, but he passed down the responsibilities to me. Um, so I wasn't 100% sure what should I should talk about, and I, didn't, I don't know the crowd too well, but I figured I would just talk about it. SpecFam 3D, it's a fairly well-known code in uh, seismology, and uh, it has a GPU version, which is kind of rare. Uh, as far as big science codes go. Or the, or GPU version that's actually faster and stuff like that, so that's nice. Anyway, so I'll get started. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to give a little introduction on SpecFem 3D as a kind of, and, and sort of talk about it as a classic example of a current scientific code that runs on a big uh, HPC cluster. Um, and sort of the, the, sort, of the, sort of the idealism of MPI with Fortran on a big cluster, you get great performance, assuming you use the right al algorithms, which it does. And then talk a little bit about how, how we attack trying to get more performance out of the code. Um, so may add GPUs, maybe better algorithms, and, and, and also why we need to get more performance, why we care. Um, so starting, uh, I'll talk about the elastic wave equation, and uh, talk about seismic imaging, which is kind of the driving force behind uh, computational seismology, and then introduce spec from 3D, and then talk about the GPU version, and just give a few things I have in my own conclusions and perspectives. Um, so basically, like in a very general sense, we talk about uh, forward problems and inverse problems. So a forward problem is, so we have G, is some sort of let's call it like a simulation function, it can simulate waves. And so the idea is that you give it an earth model and maybe an earthquake model, and then you, you can put that into the parameters and you hit start and you simulate and you get data. You get some output. And so it runs, it simulates, and it's a, so it's a forward problem. And the other kind of problem is maybe you already have some data, you recorded some, an earthquake happens, you record some data outside, and you want to try to figure out, well, which, which Earth model best describes uh, that data? So you have a simulation. You have a thing, something that the simulation can represent the physics, but maybe you don't know your model parameters. So in, in general, these Earth, the Earth model, we don't necessarily know exactly like the, the, velocity, the wave velocities in the Earth. Like we have a general uh, scheme. They have a general idea of what's happening on the way down, but they don't necessarily know a lateral, like, like sort of, uh, horizontal, they only have a radial description of the Earth model um, in terms of uh, velocities of, of waves. Um, and so this is kind of, and in general, these, the forward model, I say it's kind of like an easy problem. The, the numerical algorithms are well understood. They've been well understood for 30 years. And the programming is also relatively well understood. Uh, it's, it's Fortran MPI. You can get good performance. You're, you're sort of, uh, in, in that part, it's sort of, sort of simple. Uh, it's straightforward to do. But this inverse modeling, trying to figure out M, because G is not some big matrix. It's, it's some nonlinear function. So trying to figure out M is, is hard. It's the, the, the algorithms are, aren't, aren't necessarily there. Uh, and so, so this is, that's what I call a hard problem. So. Uh, the forward problem, here, so here we have a picture from the Spectrum manual of a simulation they did for the cover uh, in Los Angeles. And you see here, around, going around, there's, there was some source in the middle, and you have the seismic waves propagating outwards. And this is sort of a, this is a forward problem. We're simulating waves. Um, and so this is the model we're talking about. Um, so this is the elastic wave equation. So you don't need to be a physicist or a mathematician. All you have to really know is you have two derivatives in time. And this, this one, we have uh, one derivative in space here and a second one over here. So two derivatives in space. And that's really all there is to it, it's sort of classic hyperbolic PDE. Um, and, and the one interesting thing is that the C is no longer just like some sort of scalar. It's a, it's a tensor. And so you have basically the elastic wave equation as opposed to the acoustic wave equation the, the degrees of freedom, so you're not, you don't just have scalar values at every point, you actually have a vector. So uh, the points themselves displace themselves a little bit. And so that's really all that there is to know about this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of physics behind all of this, but that's not right over here. Um, and so 
we have this PDE, but now we need a discretization. So that, that uh, and we're not, we don't do any more of these sort of finite differencing, and now we do finite elements. Um, and the one they, that's quite well known now and, and that's used in SpecFem is called the spectral element method. And uh, the spectral element method is just a continuous Galerkin method, finite element method, but it has this nice property that it uses Lagrange polynomials that are lo co-located on these G GLL points, the uh, gauss legendre lobato GLL points. And so you get, uh, so if you just do the standard finite element thing, you get this matrix, this system here with M as a big matrix, U as a big long uh, vector with degrees of freedom, a K is a big, mat a big, a big matrix, and U, U is just a, the same thing. Uh, however, with these GLL uh, uh, Gaussian quadrature points, we can make M diagonal, strictly diagonal by construction. And we retain the convergence properties of the original finite element scheme, so that's why it's called spectral convergence, so that's why they call it the spectral element method. And so we can rewrite it in this form, where we have two derivatives over here and no derivatives over here, and so we can do time stepping now. Uh, explicit time stepping. So we don't have to we don't have to solve any matrices, it's all explicit. Pretty simple. And so this is very nice for parallelization. And just a few more things about the spectral element method. We, we're restricted to hexahedra currently. So if you try to use tetrahedra, just so hexahedra are like cubes, uh, and, and tetrahedra, for instance, are much more flexible from a meshing perspective, but the quadrature rule is unstable, so you can't use them. Um, and so if you do want to use tetrahedra, you have to use a discontinuous Galerkin method, which is, there's one in, in Munich called Ader DG, which uh, is a similar type of code. Um, and the meshing can be quite difficult. There's actually software packages, one of called Trellis, uh, originally, originally is Qubit, which is developed in one of the national labs in the States. And so uh, this is just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, so meshing is quite, quite uh, something of a challenge for this. So time stepping, um, you can use any explicit time stepping scheme you want. Uh, so we, uh, the spectrum code uses Newmark time stepping, which is relatively common in such codes, and it's quite nice. Uh, it, it conserves energy, or is a form of discrete energy, um, and like all um, explicit type time stepping schemes, it's limited by the, uh, the CFL condition, which is just simply just a limit on the delta. The, tel the time step is simply limited by uh, the smallest element in the mesh, uh, uh, normalized by the, vo the, the local velocity. Um, so we actually have ways of getting around this now, uh, and I, have, I can add, talk about that later if you want. Um, and, and the nice thing, though, with this scheme is basically this is a nice big vector update, and then here we have this M inverse times the stiffness matrix, and stiffness matrix is sparse. Uh, so this is sort of where the, the meat of all the computational time is spent. And the parallelization, we just do domain decomposition and just synchronize on the, the, the boundaries at every time step, just right there. And that's all the, all the MPI you need. So I have a little movie. Let's see if it runs full screen. So this is a, a movie of a, just a simple box with a seismic source in it, and we made it look extra cool. Uh, uh, so then basically you have a source located somewhere here, and then we make it, made a little cut and made sort of cool animation, make it look cool. But this is basically the idea. And we have uh, absorbing boundary conditions on the, on the walls. And so if you, if you watch, if you watch on the boundary up here, you'll notice a very small amount of reflection happening that, because the absorbing boundaries aren't perfect. So just a teeny bit of reflection you can kind of see bouncing back. Uh, but we consider that a tolerable amount of reflection. Um, and this is kind of basically, this is what SpecFem does. It simulates waves in a box. Um, and of course, you can make the box whatever shape you like. You can make it a mountain or have features in it. Um, and then, and the main thing you can all, you can have, you can localize the velocity structure inside the box. So uh, you can make it, make an Earth model out of it. So that is, um, that's the forward problem. Uh, so we can simulate waves on hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cores without any trouble. Uh, so now the inverse problem, the imaging problem, is, is much more interesting for most seismologists. Um, and basically, they're trying to do 
and, and also in, and for industry as well, trying to do uh, uh, oil discovery and stuff like that. So basically, uh, imaging or something that's called tomography or inverse problems. Um, so um, we're just trying to minimize the misfit. So we have, the, our, this is our forward problem. We have some Earth model, some starting model. And we have some data that we recorded somewhere, either using a synthetic model or real data. And we're just trying to minimize sort of the L2 norm between our simulation and our data that we have. And then we have some regularization. And the basic idea is we have some sort of functional. And using these joint tomography methods, uh, we can get a gradient. And a, basically, a gradient says um, how we should step, how we can step, take small steps to update our model. So basically, we have our, our original some starting model, and then we take a step with some step size, and we get a new model. And that, ho and that new model will reduce the error between the simulation and the data we have. Um, so here is just like an example update. This is an example gradient. So all the little blue dots are sources that we have. And the red is kind of like where the update is most needed. Uh, and, but the one thing about this is you, when, you do, when you calculate this gradient, you can only do one source at a time. And then you, and you, so you, do all, you can simulate all the sources, and then you add up all the gradients, and then you get this picture. So this is made with like 150 gradients. So in the algorithm, basically you have to simulate uh, roughly three, simula three forward simulations to get, this one, to get one gradient for one source. And then you have, say, like 150 sources to get co enough coverage to make this nice red picture here. Because you only had one single earthquake, you would maybe only get a few lines of coverage uh, uh, to where the stations you have are. Um, and this is only for a relatively small area, just, just sort of Europe, close to Italy, Switzerland, uh, maybe over to a little bit into Turkey, not even. Um, so uh, in the end, and then, and then so, this is, so this is just to get one gradient, 150 times three simulations. And then we maybe need 20 to 30 nonlinear uh, gradient iterations to converge to some Earth model. And, uh, and let's say, so some previous experiences, they'll say it takes 15 minutes on 300 cores for this relatively small mesh we saw just now. Um, so that's about 13,000 simulations and almost a million CPU hours for sort of a relatively small problem. And the, the final model we get here doesn't contain any error bars. Uh, there's no statistics, no feeling for uh, sort of confidence, no confidence intervals. We just have one model that is maybe correct, but we're not sure 100%. And so it would be nice to do some statistics on this, but even if it takes 1 million CPU hours to get a small model, uh, statistics, you maybe need 100 models, so then you're already 100 million CPU hours. Uh, and this is also a relatively small problem. So, uh, uh, so for instance, uh, the, one of the big, bigger professors in, in Princeton, you know, Trump, he's looking at doing Earth scale stuff. And so he talks about doing, let's say, 1,500 sources or 15,000 sources. So he, he has an in, had an inside grant for 100, like 400 million CPU hours on Titan. Uh, right. So uh, computationally, this, the forward stuff is pretty much solved. We, we use it for the inverse problem. But the inverse problem uh, is sort of somewhat new. It's only in the last decade we've even been trying. And there's still a lot of ways to attack the problem. Uh, the obvious one is you just let's just like work on something else for ten years and maybe something maybe they'll get the computers will be a lot better. Uh, we can also the big thing now is to try to use more nodes. So uh, the meshes we're starting with are still relatively small, so we can only use let's say up to a thousand cores per simulation before the the strong scaling starts to, to taper off too much. So we try to do uh, si simulate sources in parallel, but the the software hasn't really been written to do a lot of this efficiently. And then, of course, uh, new architectures is the big, fun new thing to talk about. Uh, so we have a GPU implementation, uh, but maybe a, a, an Intel implementation is, could be a future, future work. And then, of course, the, another big thing is better trying to work out better algorithms. So 
Uh, one is maybe avoiding the uh, CFL condition via local, local time stepping, or uh, improving the uh, adjoint methods and the gradient updates themselves to, to get more confidence in the model uh, more quickly, or just reduce the number of iterations required. So now that we kind of have a feeling for what we're trying to do, let's look at SpecFem 3D. Uh, so SpecFem 3D is generally split into two packages. There's the global version, which is you simulate on a fixed global mesh, and it doesn't not really that flexible. And then there's the Cartesian version, um, which is you can basically give it any mesh you want, any hexahedral mesh you want. Um, and so it's a classic Fortran 95 code. Uh, it optimizes really, really well. The main kernel vectorizes really great, really well, especially using the Cray compiler. Um, and the Intel compiler works well too. Um, it just it uses it's purely MPI based. It doesn't have an open MP version. And for us in practice, that's not really that big of a deal. Um, and then we also have a GPU version that's integrated into the code. Um, and it's basically organized into the three, three stages, just like you would expect. So it has a mesh decomposition stage that you would just do once per mesh. And so you just split the mesh up into parts, as many parts as you need for the number of processors. And then you prepare the mesh, and you do that once per model. And then you simulate, and that's once, once per source. And so I figured I would look, have, give you a little taste of what the code looks like. So this is obviously kind of pseudo code, but it's Fortran. So we have a time stepping loop. There's a lot of stuff that happens before, of course, loading the model, loading everything. But at some point, we start time stepping. And um, so first, we do this initial time step, like we saw, that's, uh, that takes the displacement velocity acceleration. And then the kernel, stiffness kernel computation is split into two parts. Uh, each partition has a halo region and an inside region. And so first we compute the outside, the halo region, and compute that. And then we uh, send the halo to the neighbor, all the neighbors. And then that's asynchronous. So then we can keep working on the inner part. And the inner part usually, as long as we're not too cut up, the inner part is the ratio of the inner to outer is pretty good. So we finish sending stuff on MPI and finish the stiffness kernel. And then. Uh, once that's finished, then the MPI is hopefully already finished, so we do finalize the assembly, and then uh, finalize the time step, and then we do what I call physics. Then we uh, output seismograms, calculate gradients, stuff that has to write to disk. Um, so sometimes this stuff is actually quite slow. And it can dominate the, the time. And so one cool thing is Fortran has a, uh, vector operations. Uh, which is pretty nice. So the time stepping is actually really easy. And then um, the stiffness kernel is where kind of the interesting things happen. Um, so basically, you have a loop over elements. And then each element has, for fourth order polynomials, you have 125 nodes, degrees of freedom in each element. And the degrees of freedom are shared between between elements, so if you have two, bo two boxes touching on the, on the boundaries, the, the degrees of freedom are shared. And so we can't just, uh, there's not just a big array of degrees of freedom. The, the degrees of freedom aren't organized by sort of uh, node element. They're organized by an ID, a, uh, uh, an identifier within a global degrees of freedom array. So we look up this degrees of freedom array uh, ID for the given a node and element, look it up, and then use, this is the displacement, we take it, do something with it, we do a bunch of operations, and then, so this is a gather operation in general, and then here we have a scatter operation. So we have all these contributions we calculate, we, we add them to the current value, and this is an assembly operation, so very often in finite elements you talk about assembly, so this is an implicit assembly on the boundary, uh, each element adds their contribution to that uh, shared node. Uh, so in a shared memory situation, this has to be done atomically. So on OpenMP, this works very well. And as of Kepler GPUs, the atomic operations are fast enough that this is, this is fast enough. Uh, and on Fermi generation and, and 
The one before that, uh, we actually had to use coloring algorithms to make this fast enough because the atomic operations were too slow. But now they're fast enough, so we, I basically deleted that part of the code, uh, which was pretty nice. Right. So let's talk about the GPU version now that we're already talking about it. So um, there was a, a previous GPU version, but it was standalone and more of a prototype. And so we took the, the little bit of code that was there and we integrated it into the Fortran code. And so now there's just one big code and you, config, you just configure with CUDA and then at runtime you turn it on and then uh, and it, and it uses GPUs on a GPU cluster. Um, and so we have a paper at Super, from Supercomputing a couple of years ago. Uh, so if you want to read more about it, you can. Uh, so basically just a little bit, look at what the code looks like. So we have um, these G, a GPU mode flag or parameter. And so if you're in the GPU mode, you call the GPU version of the kernel or the function. If you're on, in the C, CPU mode, you call the CPU version, um, which kind of makes the code look a little ugly. So we kind of tried to ex take these, these calls into as deep as possible so that the, over, the, the sort of normal code looked normal. Uh, and so then this gets called into the C, C uh, functions, which are CUDA C. And you'll notice, like, we have to add a little underscore to make sure to make the uh, Fortran be able to call it. Um, and then, like, we carry around this pointer to a big, a big struct that gives us, sort of keeps our state for us, all our variables and everything we need. So we pass that around. Um, and this is actually just a, like a long integer. It's kind of a weird hack, but it works. Um, like a 64-bit integer that just gets passed around and it turns out to be, it points to somewhere in memory. Um, and then we, we set up our kernel, our CUDA kernel, and launch it. Um, and we take full advantage of asynchronous launching and asynchronous memory copies, so we do the same kind of thing. We overlap our communications and computation with, for MPI. And, then here, and here's a, a CUDA kernel. Um, and so what I want to mention is that like adding, doing this work, some people were like, oh, it'll take a, maybe a month or something. And it took me almost a year to get it all working right. Um, and it's just basically, it's a high, it takes a lot of work. So if you have a code that works in CPUs and there's only a few users, it's just you or you, your, your small group, maybe it's not worthwhile. Uh, because basically, in the end, it's all or nothing. You can't just port a few, one or two things. You have to port every function because you can't... Uh, very often, many of the functions require a lot of touching a lot of the data structures, so you, you would need almost everything. And, and transferring back and forth to the CPU and the GPU doesn't really work right now. So maybe in the future, if the GPU starts living on the same processor using the same memory, then this stuff will work. Then you can just, you can just oh, we'll just write this one kernel, the big, the big heavy stiffness kernel, and we'll write that in CUDA, and everything else will be in the CPU. That would be ideal. <coughs> Uh, so let's look at a little bit of the performance. So we did some tests on XK6, which is now old and doesn't, they don't make them anymore. Uh, and this is Fermi generation stuff. And then we also did uh, XK7, which basically they just swapped out the GPUs to, for a Kepler GPU. And then we did, this is sort of Cray's now last generation CPU uh, node with 32 cores of AMD, which is about six, roughly like has 16 floating point modules, so it's more like 16 cores total. And we, we, I always compare performance node to node. So basically one GPU versus 32 or 16 cores of CPUs. Um, and we ran these at CSES here and at Oak Ridge as well. Um, so this is a 300,000 element mesh, which is relatively small, but it's fine for demos. For, for this kind of work. And this is the mesh that we did the imaging work on. And so uh, at two nodes, we have about, uh, for the new Kepler stuff against uh, the AMD chips, we have about a 4x speed up. Um, and then we scale, and it scales pretty well up to 16 nodes, and then we start to get uh, the strong scaling roll off that you expect. And this is actually, uh, at this point, 128 nodes, we're only talking about a few hundred elements per node, and so this is not really such a problem. It's, it's actually scaling quite well. Um, and so then, just one note, is that the CPU version on these Cray nodes, it actually scales super linearly. So uh, as the mesh gets cut up, I think it starts fitting into cache. And then 
you get these nice cache effects that give the code a little boost. Um, right. So the main point is the main takeaway is about 4x speed up. And if on an Intel node, you see about 3x speed up. So if we had 16 cores of Sandy Bridge, about 3x instead of 4x. And, and that's mostly because the Cray compiler is really good on these AMD chips. So it's not as fast. The newer the Intel stuff's not as not as fast as you would expect against the, with, the, with, with that Cray compiler. Um, so here's a little case study we did. Um, so we're trying to optimize this inverse problem. So we have this structure update that we saw earlier. We had 150 stations. And um, this type of um, tomography is, is, is a noise tomography. And so it has, a little, it has three steps. And in the first step, you simulate and you save the surface to disk every time step. And in the second step, you read, so you, you write 168 gigabytes to disk. And then you read, in the next step, you read those 168 gigabytes and then write uh, the boundaries to disk, which was 137 gigabytes. And then in the third step, you read it all in, the surface and the boundaries, and do it in another simulation. Um, and at the time I was doing these tests, the IO subsystems were being hammered by a bunch of other people. And so it was really hard to get good numbers, but these were reasonably representative of what we were talking about. So the first step, we're pretty good at writing, but as soon as we have to read from disk, it was really slow. Um, and I think we could probably fix this using some sort of uh, asynchronous reading or read-ahead buffering or something, uh, but we didn't have a chance to get into that. So the main point is that, like, Thinking about the I.O. is really important. Uh, perfect. Um, it's, it's kind of a really important part of all of this. Uh, so maybe even like having tools and, and libraries for doing asynchronous I.O. would be really handy. Uh, right. So I, I thought I would have one slide as a sort of as a person who has their hand, has their, is knee deep in Fortran every day, um, uh, de dealing with SpecFem and putting new algorithms into SpecFem, uh, sort of the idea that uh, at the time it was created, it was it sort of started around 2000. And I think Fortran at the time was a really good choice. Um, the code is clean, it's readable, uh, it's relatively relatively nice to use, and but, but at the same time, Fortran's really kind of, as soon as you start to get into some nice languages, it's like, oh, I have to do everything. Like the other day I was, I needed to compute, just I had like two MPI partitions and, they, and I had to compute the union of two sets of indices across the MPI partitions. And there's no library routine for this, so I had to do it by hand in a, cra in a slow way. And I didn't want to write, sit there, and sit there for a week and write a better uh, uh, merging algorithm. Um, and if I was using a, like some normal, like a Python or something, I just, type Python uh, um, union into Google, and then, oh, there's the library for it. Like, use it, think, and it's, I'm using a decent algorithm for it, and it's already right there. Um, and, and, and similarly, so I think if I was writing today uh, a new, a new uh, rewriting spec fam, I would choose C++ and then use the Eigen Matrix library, which is a templating library, which is pretty awesome. And it allows you to write matrix vector and matrix matrix and vector and scalar things it looking like it looks like MATLAB, but and it's doing fusion and and uh, sim SIMD instructions and everything it makes it really fast and really readable. So that's really nice. And C++ is a little bit more friendly, let's say, than Fortran. Um, and sort of the current way of doing stuff now is basically you do something in MATLAB or a numerical mathematician does. They write it in MATLAB. They give it to you. You look at it, learn how it works. And then you sit down for six months and you rewrite it in C++ or Fortran. And then, you, and then you get it running and then you fix bugs for another month and then it finally kind of, it works. But then it's fast. But then if they want to prototype something again, they do it on the MATLAB prototype and then you, re, and you go in a cycle here until everything's working. And so the, I think the ideal case like sort of is, is some sort of open source language that allows you to prototype. Well, your, your, prototype, doesn't, your prototype and your production thing are all in the same language. You start in something like Python, you save a lot of time not having to write a bunch of junk that you don't want to, and then 
you, you profile it and start and write it with the idea of, oh, I need to write it for a cluster. So we add MPI, add partitioning, and they start profiling it. Oh, this routine and that routine are using some slow Python loops. So we'll call that to C or call it to Fortran or whatever. And you profile and you, and you fix some slow stuff. And then a month later, you have a fast code that's still easy to read. And it's in the same environment you started with. And then if the numerical mathematician, if they write it in the same language, they can start prototyping stuff with your new code that already has all these performance features. And then, and then you're basically, that's it, you're finished. You don't have to like, make this loop of like, always re-implementing things in C++ from MATLAB. Um, and I think it's really important that it's in a, some sort of open source language because there's so many people that have this driving need to like, implement really awesome things. Like the, in Python, there's all these new libraries available for that will look at, you can add an annotation and it'll go into the loop and optimize it and generate LLVM code in the back end, all it's like vectorized and really amazing. And so there's a lot of people itching to do something like that. And so they just latched onto Python, but it could have just as easily been something else. Um, right, so conclusions. Uh, so I showed you a little bit about SpecFem and what computational seismology is all about. Uh, and the forward, and especially the inverse modeling, how imaging is really expensive. And we talked about the spectral element method and, uh, and a little bit about the GPU version. And I talked a little bit about my perspective as a developer. And I think it's sort of important to keep, when you're investing in stuff, is to sort of don't forget about the guys who write the code. Like, there's, new hardware is exciting, but if it's a real pain to write code for, there'll be a few guys writing code for it, but most of the people will be sitting there in MATLAB typing away and hoping somebody writes them a library that does some of that stuff for them. Uh, so that's all I have. I mean, so the, the oh, ten. yeah, I mean, it, it should be the same. I, I was having a lot of trouble benchmarking at the time. Um, uh, and, and ideally, like, you would, it would be more clear what's I.O. So this is step, I mean, uh, there's no explicitly I.O. time in this. Um, like, uh, uh, so the white is step, how long it took to do one, step one? to compute the whole step, including I.O. And then step two, um, yeah, and it should have been, it should have been shorter than, it should have been sheer shorter, but there, uh, the, uh, I was comparing node to node, so maybe there was something about having more ranks that made uh, the I.O. time quicker to write, to read. Uh, it's total time, total run time. So it concludes compute and I/O. So it's not totally like self-consistent. So like ideally, this blue, this light blue one, would be slightly longer than this light blue one. But for some reason, I couldn't get. It, it just always happened that this was the case when I did the benchmarks. Yeah. So it, it could have easily been. Um, like if I did it now on the new system, like it probably would come up with different results. Um, Yeah, yeah, easily could have been. Um, the, the G, this one? Um, so I'm pretty sure the cause was um, there's like one or two routines that were quite annoying to put on the GPU because they use a lot of they use library routines. They were like using some exponentials, and then there was like, it was just like a real pain to put on the GPU, so we just left it on the CPU. But then as soon as you scale down, like as soon as you add enough GPUs, all of a sudden like the time to compute everything was really small, so it, that one little chunk of CPU time, that's usually really like 1% all of a sudden became um, like a very large part of the serial execution time. Like it was sort of Amdahl's law, like for, like I think if you basically if you fit Amdahl's law to this curve, you get like three and a half four percent or something. It's so like three and a half four percent of the runtime was just sitting on the CPU organizing stuff and setting stuff up. 
and that was just obviously not parallelized. Um, Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, in the, in the end, because we ha we can do mostly we're images, we're interested in imaging, uh, so we can do. Uh, here we go. We can do 150 sources essentially at the same time. Here we're mostly limited by the I/O subsystem, because because each source has a lot of I/O. We, we would basically like we would try to like kind of create like a sort of a matrix thing, like a like a two dimensional like like strong scaling and then like source scaling, and then try to find some sort of optimal like point, like what is the sort of maximum number of sources we can simulate at the same time, and how much, how many, like how much processors should we use, and how much I.O. can we generate. Um, and so ideally you would sort of do some tests and try to work out uh, how many sources you can do at once, and then do strong scaling until you feel like that's enough. Uh, any other Um, so right when we were getting started, the PGI uh, OpenACC compiler was just coming out, and also the Cray was just starting to get their stuff together, um, and a lot of it was pretty buggy still, and I didn't really feel like debugging their compiler at the time. I mean now I think that I think the optimal case is like if you're if you're starting from scratch now with good well good like well function you're like no you're going to be on a Cray system. Uh, you can say, well, I'm going to use the Cray, Cray OpenACC compiler, and you start, like, you basically do OpenACC for the whole program, and then work out what is the lowest thing, and then write that in CUDA. And then work out the next lowest thing, and see if you can tweak it in OpenACC, but, and then write that in CUDA, and then sort of, like, work your way slowly along and figure out how much you want to do in CUDA. And so then I think you avoid a lot of bugs that way, because the compiler auto generates all the transfers you need and all the data things you need. So I think that would be the optimal like the way to do it. The only problem with that, of course, is then like if you want to develop on your laptop, there's no open AC. I guess I could I could buy the PGI compiler for my laptop. Uh, um, and that was the one nice thing with going with CUDA is that like it's has more it's easier to get your hands on than than open ACC compiler. Yeah, so this is this is the main problem I, I run into a lot. Is that like if some phys some physicist they added some new thing, and they're like, oh, we ha how do I use the GPU version? And I'm like, well, did you, who, who do you know a GPU developer? Like, I don't have time now, but maybe we, like someone could write that full code for you. And then they have to like go through the whole process of like writing that CUDA kernel and then going in the beginning and allocating the special arrays they need. And it's quite a lot of steps to like take a simple little Fortran piece of code that. It's more physics than complication. It's like it's only affecting a small amount of elements, and then you you, you go through quite a lot of effort just to get it on the on the GPU. Um, so it is this dual having, and I think this is one nice thing about the mic, is that you can do basically you just write an OpenMP version, and then you start tweaking it, and then you end up with a code that works really great on CPUs and should work in theory pretty nice pretty nicely on the on the. Um, yeah, so this is also like you could run like four ranks on an, um, on the mic, and then it, like I guess how many cores they have like eighty. So you'd have like twenty threads running on each rank, and then you maybe and use your, and have you use your partitioner to reallocate. So you have like you, you have a good partitioner that you can generate like the right size partitions for the rank, for this uh, the mic, and then maybe also for on the CPU as well. So you could do both at the same time using the same code basically. So this would be pretty nice. From a developer perspective, so you don't have to keep maintain two versions and everything, or at least minimal. Like maybe just the one kernel. It's you can't optimize it as well for one or the other. Um, but I haven't tried. I, I haven't tried this yet. Uh, something I was thinking about when they first came. Out. And I think they have a few mic systems at CSCS, but I've never tried them. Uh. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Yeah.